Thanks, Jake, and uh, thank you to Professor Burke for organizing this wonderful conference. It's been really a fascinating day. I've learned a lot, and I'm looking forward to contributing to the discussion. Uh, what could be better to talk about on a Friday afternoon than a case cruncher of an area that I've avoided my whole career as a patent professor, which is the area of subject matter eligibility? Let's jump down the rabbit hole. You can't resist an allusion to Alice um, and talk about patentable subject matter, and in particular, the implications of these types of patents um, for methods of treatment with regard to biosimilar innovation. And so uh, here's our little clicker here. Um, what do we mean by claims to methods of treatment? There's all sorts of claims we can imagine. Some examples include methods of administration of certain drugs, uh, dosage uh, regimes, treatment of new patient groups and new indications or uses. And so um, this is different from diagnostic methods, which uh, uh, Nicholson Price's colleague has indicated that diagnostics need not apply any further because you're not going to get a patent. Um, and so the question is, is, are these types of claims going to be patent eligible? And to think about how these types of patents might affect biosimilar innovation, we have to take a look at the bigger picture, which Gratefully, um, my colleagues here, um, uh, Jordan Paradise and Ariel Stern, have already led us down this path to talk about the interesting landscape that is biosimilar innovation. And in particular, we see this wide range of companies that are in this area as compared with small molecule companies. Um, they have these dual roles where they may be um, sometimes an innovator and sometimes um, um, subject to uh, others' patents. And so the role of patents in determining their effect on biosimilar innovation is not an easy question to answer, which is why we saved it for the last panel of the day. And so let's talk a little more about it. Um, who holds these patents? Who are the holders of patents on methods of treatment? Well, um, because we can see that, that sometimes they're this varied group where sometimes the manufacturers of biosimilars both hold these patents and are subject to them, we might think that this is more of a complicated question than it in fact may be. Um, because biosimilar manufacturers have to rely on the abbreviated process of obtaining marketing approval, if they seek to obtain a method of treatment on their own, then they might not have that um, pathway available to them, and they might um, have to face increased costs of dealing with uh, additional clinical trials and other regulatory hurdles. And so on balance, it would seem that in most situations that the decreasing availability of patents on methods of treatment um, would be likely to reduce barriers to innovation in the biosimilar space, at least when we're not talking about Amgen, um, when we're talking about most biosimilar companies uh, in this space. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today, right? We're going to be discussing whether these methods of treatment are indeed patent uh, eligible. And um, we'll talk um, uh, about the background about this, the statutory basis, um, the Supreme Court's views, how the Federal Circuit has started to push back a little bit against uh, the Supreme Court's um, seemingly broad take on this issue. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the trenches at the USPTO. And then we'll wrap it up with what we think might be some of the implications for biosimilar innovation. And so um, as many of you may know, um, patent eligibility is just one of many, many requirements that an invention must meet in order to obtain patent protection. Um, it's been kind of a, a, a focus lately because many see this as an inexpensive way um, to get uh, uh, rid of what they deem to be um, not such great patents or bad patents. Um, the statute is extraordinarily broad, allowing for protection for inventions in these very, very broad categories that have often been likened to uh, allowing patent protection for anything under the sun made by man. But the courts have instituted judicial exceptions, holding that certain types of discoveries, laws of nature, natural phenomenon, and abstract ideas um, should not be eligible for patent protection. The thought is that these fundamental principles are the basic tools of scientific and technological work. And should we grant patent protection on them, it might impede innovation more than it would tend to promote it. 
And so when we look at methods of treatment, we see that they could implicate the judicial principles with regard to laws of nature because either kind of the, the building blocks that are contained within methods of treatment, whether it's metabolism of a certain drug, whether it's the way that a certain patient will respond to a drug and the need to adjust dosage. Um, and so the question that we're gonna be talking about through the cases, through the um, USPTO guidelines, is whether the additional steps of administering a drug and treating a certain disease are going to sufficiently apply a law of nature to transform it to bring it into the realm, if you will, of eligible, uh, of eligible subject matter. So we're going to start off our discussion with the uh, main two Supreme Court cases in this area, Prometheus v. Mayo and Alice. And um, Prometheus v. Mayo, this is also the face that most patent attorneys made when this case uh, came down from the Supreme Court. Um, and in fact, many of us continue to make um, in light of the vagaries of this decision. And so this uh, case involved a method of optimizing therapeutic efficacy for treating an immune-mediated GI disorder involving administering a drug, determining the level of active ingredient of that drug, the metabolite, and then recalibrating the drug. It's a personalized medicine patent, okay? And so the Supreme Court found that this patent claim, the representative patent claim, recited a law of nature, the relationship between drug dosage and patient metabolism. And they determined that this should not be eligible unless the application of the natural law would amount to significantly more than the law of nature itself. And so the court looked at the elements of the claim and asked whether there was an inventive concept significant enough to transform the law of nature into eligible subject matter and held here that it did not. It looked at the steps of administering and said that's just doctors who treat patients. It looked at the step of recalibrating dosage and that says that's just a natural law. It said looking at the level of metabolite in the blood is just conventional activity and if you put it all together, you don't get anything more than the law of nature itself and therefore no patent protection for this personalized medicine patent. Which brings us to Alice, which doesn't really make us all that much more happy in terms of its specificity. Everyone's saying, why are we talking about software? We're talking about biosimilar innovation, but we're really just talking about this case to get the test. Um, it looked at mitigating risks associated with online transactions using an electronic escrow service. And this case was directed to an abstract idea. And so the court found that it was uh, uh, not going to be eligible for patent protection because uh, generic computer implementation was not enough to transform that abstract idea into a patent eligible invention. So we get our two-step test, and this is what we're going to be focusing on for the remainder of the discussion. Does the claim at issue, if we've got a claim that looks like it recites a law of nature, which methods of treatment seem to do, are they directed to an ineligible concept? And then if so, do the elements of the claims individually or together contain that inventive concept to bring them into the realm of eligibility? And so switch to the federal circuit after these cases come down um, and in Arios of Sequinon. If you haven't heard about this invention yet, truly groundbreaking, um, allowing for the detection of chromosomal abnormalities um, in a, a pregnant patient um, by a simple blood draw. Removing the need for amniocentesis, really quite, quite groundbreaking. Um, phrased as a method of detecting um, the existence of these chromosomal abnormalities by detecting what's called cell-free fetal DNA, fetal DNA within the mother's bloodstream, um, and amplifying it, standard technique. And then we get to the federal circuit who says we, a lot of the judges say, we don't want to apply Mayo, but we have to. This is the precedent. The law, uh, the claims here are directed to a natural phenomenon, the existence of this fetal DNA in the mother's bloodstream. But because the method steps of amplifying DNA are well understood and conventional, this groundbreaking method is not new or useful. Okay, cut back to that face of Mayo, right? The attorney's look uh, of Mayo. Cert petition, almost two dozen um, amicus briefs are uh, um, uh, filed asking the Supreme Court to please provide guidance and the Supreme Court denies cert. 
So the federal circuit, realizing that it's on its own to work through the two-step test, decides it's time to push back, okay? I'm gonna highlight the cases in which I see some pushing back. There are many, many, many more cases where it simply decides that invalidity is affirmed on 101 grounds, particularly for diagnostic methods similar to Arios of Sequinum. Pushback number one, we're gonna call out what directed to means, right? Nearly every claim involves a law of nature. After all, they do take place in the physical world. And so step one says, let's figure out what the focus of the claims is. We're back to a little bit of computer discussion. This particular case talked about the functioning of a computer and was therefore found eligible. They're directed to this self-referential table. I'm not gonna get into computer speak, don't worry. Just bringing out this case to express that this is kind of the one of the pushback cases that says, we're gonna figure out what directed to means. We're gonna push back on that test, okay? We see it again, cells direct. Again, push back on step one, what is directed to mean? These claims talk about a laboratory technique of pre uh, preserving hepatocytes and they're found eligible, even though the court says the inventors did discover this natural law, which is the ability of these cells to survive multiple free soft fight cycles, say that four times fast, they did not claim that natural law, but instead they claimed applications of that knowledge. And so it seems like in this case, the federal circuit is blessing methods of treatment. They even say, we like that these claims are reciting processes to achieve a desired outcome, namely methods of treating disease. And the fact that one way to describe the natural ability of the subject matter to undergo that process, it's not gonna make the claim directed to that process. And it gives us some nice examples. We could imagine a claim of treating cancer cells with chemotherapy. That's not directed to the cell's natural inability to survive chemotherapy. We could imagine a claim to treating headaches or some other issue with a drug. That doesn't mean it's directed to the human body's natural response to that drug. All right, pushback three. Yeah, it's non-precedential, but I like it anyway. So I wanna talk about it because it talks about step two. And so far, I've only been talking about step one of the Alice test directed to. Step two says, is there an inventive concept? Is there something significantly more than the natural law that's transformative? And so I like this case, the forehead scanner. Maybe you guys have used it before, you've seen it, right? It's the method of detecting body temperature by making radiation readings, moving the temperature, the radiation detector thermometer across a region to uh, go over an artery and uh, electronically determine body temperature approximation. Nobody disputes this is directed to a natural law and an abstract idea. It involves all sorts of mathematical equations that look like abstract ideas. It involves temperature measurements from the forehead. So let's get to step two. Step two says, is there an inventive concept that transforms that natural law into something that is, or that law of nature to something eligible? Well, the federal circuit says, these claim steps may have been known in the art to figure out whether there's hot spots indicating injury or tumor but they have not been used to solve this problem of detecting arterial temperature beneath the skin. And interestingly, they focus on something they haven't often focused on in this area, which is the fact that this test cost millions of dollars and took lots of years of development. And now the inventors recognize the coefficient that allows for the calculation of the temperature, but they apply it in an unconventional way of temperature measurement. Is anyone's head spinning yet? Mine is, right? This is all over the place. The presentation, I hope not, but the court's decisions, right? Trying my best to distill them into something manageable, but this is why I never got into el the eligibility business before now. All right, Justice Hughes says, right? Come on, this is a law of nature. It's a calculation using commercially available technology that he says is not an inventive concept. All right. Second step, uh, uh, second case I should say that pushes back on step two is BASCOM, method of filtering internet content. And the reason why I mention this one is it mentions that an ordered combination of limitations, even if they're conventional, can also provide an inventive concept, okay? So we get the federal circuit pushing back. It's pushing back on step one, saying directed to, we don't think everything that recites a law of nature and applies it is directed to, 
push back on step two on the inventive concept. We think even conventional things that are applied to solve a new problem or that are applied in a way that together is inventive it can be sufficient, okay? Last case. Told you it was gonna be massive case crunching, right? What better to do on a Friday afternoon? Vanda. Vanda looks at the razor thin line between diagnosis and treatment. It's a method of treating patients who have schizophrenia using iloperidone. And the court finds that these claims are patent eligible. This is another personalized medicine case. It depends on determining that a patient is a poor metabolizer. How? By determining that they have a genotype that shows that they have a CYP2D6 uh, genotype. And this method will reduce the risk of uh, QT prolongation, which is a heart rhythm disorder that can result in sudden death. Okay, so the majority says, yes, the inventors recognized the natural law, but they claimed an application of it. Therefore, the claims are eligible because it's a new way of using this drug that's safer. Okay, they also found the fact that there were specific dosages recited in Vanda's claims to be um, significant. Already I see um, Nicholson Price giving me the look of, mm, I don't think so, all right? Let's look at the two claims. Good, you know, good Lord, if you're not a patent attorney, you know, when the uh, economist came out and showed her equation, she said, you can, you can look down now. I won't spend too much time on these claims, but if you look at these claims, they sure look similar. There's a method of administering a drug, we're talking about treatment versus optimizing therapeutic efficacy for treatment. Now granted, there is a specific dosage listed. There is a genotype of CYP2D6, but that genotype is often a poor metabolizer of many, many different drugs. And yes, we are reducing the risk of QTC uh, prolongation. That's why in dissent, Chief Judge Process, this is essentially identical to Mayo. This is no more an optimization of treating schizophrenia than Mayo is of optim opt optimizing the therapeutic efficacy of thiopurine drugs, okay? All right, let's turn now to the USPTO. And the problem with Jake being moderator is that he speaks right after I do, so I know he's going to keep me on time. So I actually um, have the six examples up here that I don't, I know I don't have time to go through, Jake. I know. Um, so I'm not going to go through all six. I'm going to go through the two that deal with methods of treatment. Um, the USPTO put forth these examples. Um, one of these examples, um, or these sets of examples, relates to the diagnosis and treatment of this fictional disease they came up with, gelitis, um, that uh, is determined by detecting a newly identified protein marker. And the USPTO provided these seven examples, finding all are eligible, even though their finding directly contradicts what the Federal Circuit found in Ariosa and has been finding in cases, including yesterday's case, another Mayo case, um, that finds that methods of detection and diagnosis, again, Becky Eisenberg, are not eligible, okay? so. I'm just showing you claim one. Can't talk about it in no time. Detection. PTO says it's patent eligible. That's not what the Federal Circuit says in Ariosa v. Sequinon. Claim two, um, I'll just, I'm gonna skip through these. Again, Jake's gonna keep me on time. I know he will, and I appreciate that. All right, let's skip to claims five, six, and seven. These are methods of diagnosing and treating a disease involving the newly identified protein marker. Court finds it's patent eligible even if the detection is recited at a high level of generality and the recited treatment is conventional. The USPTO states that if you have administration in combination with other elements, that together amounts to significantly more than the exception itself. If we put together the combination, it's inventive because people who were previously inaccurately diagnosed will now be, will now be accurately diagnosed and properly treated, and that's consistent with Vanda. Claim seven is more general still. It's just a method of treating disease by administering known products, anti-TNF antibodies, also found to be patent eligible because PTO says they're not directed to a natural law, right? Even though the claim recites a nature-based product limitation, if we look at the claim as a whole, it's focused on a product of practically applying the nature uh, the natural product to treat a particular disease. And the court 
uh, the court. The PTO says if we put these steps together, they themselves are not natural laws. It's consistent with Vanda. Probably reads Mayo's holding even broader than the Federal Circuit does in Ariosa, but there it stands. USPTO methods of treatment for now seem to be uh, patent eligible, that they will provide and grant patents on them. So this brings us to the big question that Nicholas's, you know, you know, kind of side, side, uh, side, side mouth was when I was talking about whether Vanda sh you know, should or should not be patent eligible, which is should these claims be different, right? Should the eligibility of diagnostic versus treatment claims be any different? I mean, is this really a distinction without a difference? Is it artful dodging via claim drafting? You never thought you'd miss, well, I guess it's Will Ferrell portraying W or W, you never thought you'd miss it, but is this some type of, as he put it, strategery um, in order to get around examiner rejections? And are we just pushing at the margin? Because we don't want to deal with the real problem of whether or not these things should be eligible. So I leave you with that question. I don't answer it, I just pose them. Um, why does it matter? Okay, so let's kind of get to our last area of the discussion, which is how does this impact biosimilar innovation? And so um, method of treatment patents for biologics um, have been challenged in IPR proceedings, um, suggesting that biosimilar manufacturers may feel that these claims will be asserted against them. And so they have um, uh, used these proceedings to invalidate such claims. Um, however, as, as many of you may know, you can't bring an eligibility challenge during an IPR proceeding. Um, and so these eligibility challenges have to be brought in court. Um, and then this may not be an option, right? If the USPTO is getting it wrong and biosimilar companies have to go to court to invalidate these claims on the basis of eligibility, this may not be an option for the smaller to mid-sized companies, not Amgen, um, as median litigation costs, for example, in Hatch-Waxman actions, where more than 25 million are at risk, are 1.8 million, according to the AIPLA 2017 economic survey. Given the higher cost of developing, developing um, biosimilars and biologics, the cost may be even higher. Um, so again, if the USPTO is not getting this right, eligibility challenges may not be brought as often as they need to be. Um, other issues um, with regard to the effects of eligibility on methods of treatment uh, for biosimilar innovation is that methods of treatment claims are often focused on indications and dosage regimes, and they often need to be set forth in the label, and so that too may act as a barrier to biosimilar entry. Maybe we can avoid some of these issues through labeling strategies, but insurance reimbursement issues may undercut some of these um, possibilities. And then, uh, other kind of uh, aspects of the effects of eligibility to the extent that the party that's performing the diagnostic step is different from the party that is performing treatment, um, these claims could have limited infringement reach um, if we can separate out the actors. And finally, even if down the road these methods of treatment claims are found to be ineligible, um, as we heard about today, right? Nicholson talked a little bit about manufacturing methods and processes, um, their formulation patents. Um, Dan has written, Dan Burke has written on um, compositions of matter and their patent eligibility. Um, these are all still areas that are likely to pose barriers for uh, entry of biosimilars into in a, a, the innovative market. And so, Jake, how am I doing? How'd I do? You are doing just Am I doing all right? Or you got another all right, sounds good. Someone's going to ask me to go through those other uh, USPTO claims, I bet. Right, somebody's just, a couple patent is disappointed. She went through those seven claims so fast, we didn't have our fill, all right? So um, let me open it up for questions. Thanks. Um, so I have a question about your, I want to say, third to last slide where you talked about litigation costs. And I'm just wondering, like, we might worry that litigation costs are a big deal if biosimilar entrants were typical kind of small or medium entities, but right. given that the cost of developing a biosimilar are already in the hundreds of millions True. of dollars, and that we tend to see entry from like J and J and Pfizer and Sandoz and like big companies, right? Um, how much of a barrier really is the fact that you have to go through the courts other than just do an IPR? Well, so I think 
anytime you're looking at the cost of developing a product, you're going to look at the entire picture, right? And so you're right that the court costs are one component of the assessment one would make about whether it's worthwhile to enter into the area. And so maybe from the get-go, you look at the uh, patent, you look at the state, and you might not bother. Um, just the mere fact that the patent exists, we've talked about this, particularly um, Michael Carrier, right, has talked about patent thickets. If there's enough patents out there, not just on the compositions of matter, but all these methods of treatment, methods of use, formulation, when you have this patent thicket that, that again, as Michael has pointed out, then that alone might, <laughs> might discourage more than one entrant, right? We've talked about how we have this interesting dynamic in this space where it's not like your typical small molecule drug where we have, you know, you know, more than one, let's say, generic coming into the market. We often see a duopoly in some ways or maybe a, you know, a, a limited number of, of competitors. And so it may be, you know, that, that um, it's, not, it's not necessarily that the, the challenge is so great from a monetary perspective as much as just kind of an, an overall barrier to entry when we think about the cost of getting through the, the litigation as, as a general matter. But I, I do take your point in, 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 in that, that it may not be that the distinction is between an IPR versus the court battle. The court battle is probably coming either way. So I think that that's a, a fair point to, to consider in thinking through this. So thanks. Yeah. All right, Jake. So. <clears throat> Please correct me if I'm wrong, right? But it seems that in part of your talk, you're you're drawing what I feel like is this hard bar between methods of treatment and diagnostic claims. Right. And it's my impression that the difference between those two types of claims tends to run from the preamble. Um, and if that's the case, don't you just consider the difference between those two things to just be you know, the draftsman's art, if we're going to use the, you know, if we're going to use the Supreme Court analogy here, right, that kind of the only difference between a method of treatment and diagnostic claim simply comes in the preamble. It's simply whatever the patent attorney feels like is going to get past the patent examiner. And that all things being equal, that seems like a silly 101 hook, right? That if really like the only difference between these two things is that I call like a method for diagnosing the following illness, or a method for treating the following illness, wherein and all of the limitations, right, are exactly the same. Right. Then, like, it seems silly to hang a one-on-one hat on it, right? I mean, I'm just wondering what you. So, so I think this is a great point, right? I think that the, the problem is is the federal circuit is a little bit between a rock and a hard place because of the Supreme Court's decision. So I think that you see this language time and time again, and in fact, even in yesterday's decision, we saw this language that that's, that you see the judges of the federal circuit saying we don't like Mayo. And yet our hands are bound by this decision that is causing us to limit. And there's been, there's been countless um, um, statements in these cases that say, we think this is bad for innovation. We think it's a bad decision, and yet we are bound by it. And so this discussion really has been the Federal Circuit, originally in Ariosa, saying, help, you know, help us, give us something we can work with, and we can still promote innovation. And the Supreme Court didn't take it. And then I think you're left with the Federal Circuit saying, well, then you know what? We're going to go ahead and we're going to just, you know, we're going to whittle away at the margins. We're going to take this unfinished block of wood you've given us and we're going to take our knife and we're going to whittle it into something that we can make work because you've left us with nothing. And if it ends up turning on a method of treatment versus a method of diagnosis and you want us, Supreme Court, as, as the Federal Circuit to say that by applying, by having a treatment step, now we've magically transformed this diagnostic claim that was abstract and a law of nature, and now we've made it applied enough that we can say that it's something, that there's something there, then that's what we're going to do, right? And it's it's kind of harkens back to the old doctrine of magic words when we first saw was it the Beauregard claims yeah, where yeah. where we said you know oh software is scary let's go ahead and put it into this tangible medium right. which was really no different than software, right? And so it it really is reminiscent of that um, that kind of we're going to do what we need to do because you're not giving us the guidance we need to try and promote innovation in the best way we can. So, 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 and, and I'm waiting for for Nicholson's side mouth uh, for that. Oh, a, oh, a dramatic, you can't see this on camera, a dramatic rolling of eyes. Love it. All right. So it seems, it seems really fascinating that you're bringing up Beauregard in this context, because if that's true, and I think that that's generally true, then maybe like the, just the, one 
way to very simply cut the Gordian knot is just to lose the preamble in 101 analysis, just period, right? If it's subject matter eligible under the limitations not including the preamble, then it's subject matter eligible, right? And, you know, patent attorneys can do whatever they want to do with respect to the preamble when it comes to 102 and 103, and that's, you know, fine, and we can, like, kind of live with that weird legal fiction, but, like, I think that would be, I think that's one, like, pretty easy solution to this, no? Well, possibly. I mean, I think the preamble is always interesting to think about, right? The, the, the law about reading preambles into claims is, and of itself, such a fuzzy area, right? That sure. the, the, you see some of this, you know, um, language in the court uh, cases where it almost sounds like a yoga instruction that we'll, we'll consider the preamble when it breathes life and vitality yes, into the yes, claims yes, or yes, these, yes, these, right. these kind of, you know, insane types of uh, attempts to determine whether the preamble actually matters. And so I think maybe that this is a situation where we, we, we have to kind of, again, play at the margins to try and get something workable, even if it seems like we're all kind of shaking our heads going, this all seems a little bit too difficult, right? It all seems like we're trying too hard, and yet we, we, we try and maneuver within the framework that, we're, that we've been you know, given and try and fashion it to something that I think is workable. Okay, yeah, Timo. From a comparative European perspective, I think also that Prometheus judgment got it all wrong in terms of you know structure of patent law and non obviousness and rigidity. I think it just mixed it up. And you know, after having met the inventor in the Ariosa case, the inventor of, the, of that patent in Hong Kong, I you know I, I decided to write a, a petition, uh, the Supreme Court, you know, laying down the, the European law, which is of course maybe not the best argument uh, to convince the Supreme Court, but of course, as we all know, it, they didn't take the case. And I wonder if you think that the Wanda decision might open up another door. And I also have heard that there are some attempts to introduce a strict you know, research exemption or many uh, a codified research exemption mm -hmm. in, in Congress, mm -hmm. and uh, that that maybe might give another reason to consider to maybe open up the legibility, legibility doctrine a little bit again. Okay, well, I, do, you, do you see any chance that this might happen? Yeah, I love your question because I, it, it kind of gets me thinking that maybe the reason we are in the bind we're in is that we haven't had an ample research exception. Exactly. That, that we have a very narrow research exception mm -hmm. and had the research exception been a bit broader, a little bit more generous, right. measured, right. but still a little more generous, maybe we wouldn't find ourselves in the bind we're exactly. in with 101. Exactly. I do wonder exactly. whether that might be, that might be um, kind of a, a causal factor in kind of how we've gotten to where we are at yes. this point. Um, there's also kind of a, a clamoring in place. Um, I think um, Colleen Chen and others have written about this recently, um, about deferring 101 matters, focusing on 102, 103, even though it's more costly to go through those doors before going through 101, kind of as in the same way that um, the courts defer you know, constitutional issues, and they, they handle other issues before they go down the constitutional road, even though, again, it, it may be more costly, but then you avoid some of the tougher questions. On the other hand, maybe that just puts off the inevitable, and it takes longer to get the um, development of the doctrine that, that you know, maybe is, is needed. So I think that the, I that's I agree a, with you, but my hope is that if we would have one day codified research exemption, a proper research exemption in the U.S., that maybe the Supreme Court would be feel brave again to take such a case to open up the door a little bit more rigidly. It's a very, very interesting point, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it looks like the Federal Circuit has found a loophole to the Supreme Court uh, opinions. So how long do you think that'll work? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, in yesterday's decision, the court was very clear that even though it was striking down Mayo's, um, it wasn't, well, Mayo was, was bringing the challenge, even though it I'm struck sorry, down yesterday? Uh, yesterday, Mayo versus Athena, um, and it was a, a diagnostic method, um, the court struck that down, but reiterated that had it been a treatment claim, as in Vanda, that it, it, that would likely have um, uh, not been struck down. So it, it again, um, or it didn't quite go that far, but it did say that that Vanda was um, still going to be good law, and that um, it distinguished the case at bar from Vanda, and saying that the method of treatment claims um, were, were more likely to be found eligible. So it seems that the the, the Federal Circuit has kind of doubled down um, on on Vanda in that in that regard. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick observation sure. as a non patent attorney, yeah. which is, so, but what I do think a lot about are like FDA guidelines and regulations. There's this BEST document, the, this, it's a, the biomarkers, endpoints, and other tools document that's published by the FDA and the NIH, which is like extraordinarily crisp. Like if you're actually trying to get biomarkers validated, the 
regulatory side of things is super crisp about what constitutes a predictive biomarker versus a treatment biomarker versus a diagnostic biomarker. And just as an outsider, it's this is fascinating to me because there are entire other places where people are like commercializing products mm -hmm. based on established language that's like clearly not applicable here. And like, I just think that's like an interesting fact that like when we're, you know, when you're trying to get endpoints validated um, and recognized by regulators, that's a totally different standard. And I guess that would support Nicholson's argument that, that the FDA is maybe the better venue for, um, you know, disclosure and other kind of more, more um, fine line um, yeah, types of... I don't of... have the qualifications to say that, but it just, it's, it's interesting that like, yeah. uh, to me, again, it just like, I, 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 I kind of get snapshots of these cases over right. time, but I just, in, in the world that I live in, the regulatory side of things is so extraordinarily crisp and moving in a direction of being more explicit about what's what and that, right. it, that like we can't in patent law even like properly differentiate between like treatment versus diagnostic tool like that's just for the outsiders like that, that like that just take that for what it's worth but it surprises me as someone who thinks about the regulatory side and not the legal again this is why i've deferred any discussion of eligibility in yeah. in in my research until this point in my career i've <laughs> waited as long as i could and and now it's just it's time it's all coming out so um i i see jake is giving me the the, the nod yes i think so I yeah the yeah if there's there any, yeah. oh yeah uh, okay yeah, the pto's guideline uh of this year is that not just treatment, but also prophylaxis? Yes. Are, but what do you what do you how do you interpret that? Term? What does that mean? Prophylaxis? Does that expand the, the scope of treatment to a different level? Is there any basis for that? What do you? What do you so it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, when I mean, just again at first blush, I, I don't know that there's been any case on that. Uh, prophylaxis to me sounds like preventative measures, um, which to me sounds like some type of of. Well, you know, that, that I guess I'm kind of thinking just through it on off the cuff right now that it may not require anything more than telling a patient about what they have as opposed to requiring them to actually do anything. And so it's interesting that they include prophylaxis in the guidelines because it may not be what the courts would deem sufficiently applied to transform the, the law of nature detection or diagnosis into something more substantial. And so that will be very interesting to see how that develops. What we've seen from the USPTO guidelines is, is that just because the PTO says it's likely to be eligible, we know that the courts may not always agree with what they would deem eligible. Right. One last question. Sure. Uh, it says that, uh, one of the claims says administering vitamin D to a patient, but actually it's up to the patient to take the pill. It's not really you administer. You just do, you either tell the patient to take the pill or you give the pill to the patient. I mean, that, what does administer mean? Wow. If you just tell somebody to take the pill, is that administering or, I mean, you, do you have to actually take take the person and then right. put the pill in their yeah. mouth, right? Uh, yeah, um, so I think that that's, that's a very interesting question. I don't know um, that uh, when we've looked at prior situations where we've had administration of, of drugs that we've actually required the patients, for example, to follow through on taking, on taking those drugs. It may be that the act of, of providing the medication is sufficient to show an application. That would be, that would be the way I would, I would probably um, you know, analyze the administration type of step, so. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks.